All right. So this meeting is now being recorded. Um, so let's go ahead and get started here. So I, I just wanted to open up, if there are people who are new to results on this, I want to just tell you a little bit about who results is. Um, results, as we describe it in our little booklets, is a movement of passionate, committed, everyday people. Um, and together we use our voices to influence political decisions that will bring an end to poverty. We know that the po solutions to poverty all exist already and that we believe that creating political will to put them in place is key to, to ending poverty. You know, and as volunteers receive, receive training, support, and inspiration to become skilled advocates. Um, and then in time, we really learn to effectively advise our policymakers in Washington, guiding them toward decisions that will improve access to health, education, and economic opportunity here in the United States and around the globe. And then together, we realize the incredible power we possess to use our voices to, to change the world. And we've had that experience over the past 37 years. Um, so a couple of things on what are we trying to do as we advocate with our members of Congress, as we try to move them um, along on issues of health, education, and economic opportunity. I like to describe it in this really sort of simple slide here. And for those who can see it, we're really trying to move them up what we call the champion scale, essentially take, trying to figure out where they are in their support for our issues, either you know, they're an opponent or they're uninformed, they might not know about it, or they're neutral and have not voiced anything. They might be a supporter, an advocate, a leader, or a champion. And so after we identify where they are on the champion scale, our goal is to move them up to the next level. If someone is an opponent, we really want to give them enough information and we have them question that opposition. And, and then perhaps they move into the neutral zone at that point and they're not voicing so much opposition. If someone's already a supporter on an issue, then we want to move them to become an advocate. Basically, once they've supported an issue, then asking them to reach out perhaps to other members of Congress, asking them to support it and thereby becoming an advocate. Um, we think about how de decisions maker, decision makers make decisions and we try to go into our decision makers through as many channels as possible. And what we find is that go as constituents, that's some of the, the strongest ways we can go to our, to our members of Congress. We also work with their staff and we uh, have colleagues talking to each other in Congress. We work with the media we acknowledge that paid lobbyists also um, do have influence in Washington, but also experts and personal history come into play as well. And then the good news is, though, about influence is that in several studies that have happened over the past 20 years by the Congressional Management Foundation, they have surveyed um, over 1,200 con congressional staff people in Washington and asked them a number of different questions, but this one in particular stands out. If a, if a member has not made a decision on a particular issue, how much influence might these various tactics have um, on helping them make their decision? And if you look at this, this chart here in front of you, the staff said that in the light blue, they would have a lot of positive influence and the dark blue said it would have some positive influence. But the things that are at the top of the list are in-person, issue visits from constituents, those are people like you and I, 94% said that that would have either a lot or some influence. Contact from constituent representatives, something like I'm here um, uh, with results on behalf of people in my community, in my, in my faith community and others uh, to here to talk to you about these issues of poverty. Individualized email messages, individualized postal letters, and then local editorial represent uh, referencing an issue pending, so that's an editorial, and then comments during a telephone town hall and phone calls. So you can see that these all these top influencers are really about what you and I can do with our elected officials. You see visit from a lobbyist is, is somewhere eighth or ninth down there. It's important, but it, but it doesn't have as much influence as we have. So again, that's good news for us in using our voice. And then just, just some quick examples of some of our global successes, and we're going to talk more, let our, our um, activists talk more about their experience in, in, um, in Zambia. But, you know, our advocacy has really helped cut need, needless child deaths in half since 1990. We haven't done that solely. We've done it with a lot of help from people, but we have really driven the U.S. agenda on this and also worked with our colleagues around the world to do the same. And um, in 1990, it was estimated that 12.9 million children under age five were dying each year 
to largely preventable causes, really sort of dumb things, diarrhea, lack of vaccinations, lack of proper nutrition. That number is 5.9 million today, which is still a huge number, but that's, um, you have to have to take into consideration that the, the planet has increased by several billion people since 1990, and we want to get that job done. And then last year, we secured uh, a U.S. pledge to the Global Fund to, to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. It's going to ha help save 8 million additional lives. So that's the kind of things that RESULTS does. And then just finally, RESULTS believes that we need to be in relationship with our elected officials to make sure that they know what we care about and what we want them to do. And our goal is really to move them up the champion scale by being in relationship, by providing good information, making specific requests, and mobilizing the media and community. Finally, as we uh, move on to the rest of the agenda, I'm gonna have Mark moderate here. Um, the goals of the Zambia tour that um, our advocates went on were to see really how our advocacy for health and education programs shows up in, in a country like Zambia. We do a lot of advocacy from thousands of miles away, but what really happens when it shows up there in Zambia? Se uh, secondly, to share our advocacy experience with our Zambian colleagues. The, the advocacy that Results teaches us to do is invaluable not only here, but in other parts of the world, and we wanted to share that. And then finally, we want to share what we witnessed and experienced in Zambia back here in the United States so that people understand that these investments save lives, change lives, and transform nations and build huge, valuable partnerships uh, between the United States and other nations. So, uh, Mark, are you on the line here? I am. Can you hear me? Yeah, we, Mark, we, we can. Uh, would you want to leave? The rest of the agenda here? Sure, I can take over here. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Uh, I'm going to um, introduce uh, some of the advocates that went with us to, on the um, Zambia tour to share their experiences uh, in a variety of different areas and, and things that we saw and people that we met with um, and, and to share the experiences of what they came away with and how seeing our advocacy on the ground, uh, meeting with with Zambians who are affected directly by uh, the work that we do, uh, how that was impactful for them and, and some messages that they would like to share with you. Um, so first up, uh, Lindsay, are you on? Yes, I'm on. Great. Uh, I think I'm gonna have to share from my screen because the PowerPoint is not working. One moment. And Lindsay, why don't you go ahead and get started and I'll get the pictures running in the background. Okay. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Along with 11 other grassroots advocates, I had the privilege to represent North Carolina in a visit to Zambia, and I was amazed to hear about the massive improvements it has seen since the country was at war with disease in the early 2000s. The support provided by the U.S. has enabled people to become healthy and strong again, take care of their families, be a part of improving the quality of life, and change health practices. There is now a country with a generation of citizens who are thriving and self-sufficient. On our first day of business, we visited the embassy, um, which was actually a personal dream of mine, and we met with U.S. aid, including Bethany Baxter, who is the country coordinator for PEPFAR. For those of you who do not know, PEPFAR is the President's Emergency Program for AIDS Relief, uh, and this was introduced by President George W. Bush in January 2003. Bethany expressed optimism in the prospect of seeing an AIDS free generation in the next three to five years. And she is particularly aware of the need to be accountable with regular communication and consultation about progress and achievements. To this day, Zambians speak with admiration about President Bush's support through PEPFAR and the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, tuberculosis and Malaria. Um, we had spent three special events on our Friday. We visited a Buafano Integrated Services Organization Center. And Buafano operates in four districts of the country. We visited sites in Lusaka and Chibombo. Uh, their program includes eight components, including home-based care programs, community health clinics, uh, community therapeutics, care for malnourished children and orphans and vulnerable children's program, as well as a community school. The picture that you're seeing now is the picture that I took of the kids when we got off the bus. The sound of happy, excited children when our bus, bus pulled onto the property prompted me to break out in excited screams. As an educator, children just get to me. We met Beatrice Chola, who received the Women in Development Award by the United Nations Country Team in 2003. 
And then we visited a couple classrooms, the clinic, met with one of the home care volunteers. And uh, later on, I became that somewhat cliche blonde woman dancing and singing with children. Uh, it was a beautiful experience. Later, we went to a village called Chibambo and joined community volunteer social workers for home visits. Parents there are receiving coaching and children who need it most are receiving monitoring care. And I remember a volunteer named Memory. Uh, he's a bright man who walked about with a limp and a smile. We had lunch with the villagers and volunteers and I felt like we were part of their, their community for just that afternoon. Um, finally, on the way back to Lusaka, we stopped by a one-stop gender-based violence center, which is supported by USAID. We certainly need more of those in the state, so they're leading us in that capacity. Um, overall, the attitudes, gratitude, and optimism, willingness of Zambians to give and be part of their community really made an impression on me, and I still get really excited talking about it. It was just fantastic to see. Thank you. Who's next? Mark? Hmm. So well. while you're waiting, you're seeing the picture mm -hmm. of us where we're meeting with Beatrice Schiller at Guafano. So let me see. I, so I have here Beth on the list next. Oh, OK. I can go next. I don't know. <laughs> So I wrote down my remarks because I always forget what I'm going to say. So this is what I'm going to read to you. The Zambian Minister of Justice, Given Labinda, met with the five of us and Nathan Nalani, a SITAM plus staff member on Tuesday morning. Um, so previously, Mr. Lubinda had, been, had made it possible for Nathan to deliver community members letters after office hours to the government official who added the budget line item for Zambia to make its first pledge to the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria. Minister Lubinda formally welcomed us to Zambia and thanked us for meeting with him. We thanked him for his role in making it possible for Nathan to deliver the letters that led to the government of Zambia's pledge to the Global Fund. We politely asked that those funds be paid soon. We also urged him to ensure that the remaining 350 community health clinics that the government had promised be built. Our request seemed to bother the minister. He said that the money was already appropriated and they would be built. He wondered aloud why we didn't know that already. He complained to Nathan that he ought to be more focused on ensuring that the Zambian provinces implement their health programs than focusing on the national government. Now, because I'm a grassroots representative on the results board, I sat up very tall and spoke with as much authority as I could muster. I said that CTAM Plus was our valued partner, that the results board of directors relied upon CTAM Plus to ensure that the implementation of the global fund projects in Zambia were effective and monitored. I pointed out that Carol Kachenga, the executive director of CTAM Plus, serves on the oversight committee of the Zambia Country Coordinating Mechanism for the Global Fund. I said that we are highly appreciate the role that CTAM Plus fills in Zambia. More polite discussion ensued. We thanked Minister Lubinda for the meeting. Our training for how to advocate in meetings with our members of Congress served us well for our meeting with the Justice Minister. Later, Nathan and Carol contacted the local media. Two reporters, one with the Daily uh, Nation newspaper came to interview us. The next day, the newspaper carried a story on the top of the inside front page, quoting our request for completion of the 350 health clinics. And here it is. There we are. <laughs> Thanks for that, Beth. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm not sure if Mark, are you there? Well, Mark might be having problems here with the audio. Um, so let's see if, is Fran, are you on the line? And if you're muted, Fran, hit star one. Okay, not sure about that. We'll see if we can get Fran in here soon. 402-415. Is that you? Is that you, Fran? 402, this yep. Me. I'm okay. here on the short side, Larry. Yeah, go ahead, Fran. Okay, so I was going to talk about CHAZ, which is the Church Health Association of Zambia. Um, 
we learned that uh, money does not go directly from USAID to another government. It goes to NGOs. Uh, and uh, CHAZ is one of those NGOs that's uh, set up to deliver the best holistic family-centered approach care that we could imagine. Uh, it was founded in 1970 to, pour, to serve the poor and the poorest. Uh, it includes 16 denominations, and um, they have 73 health care sites, and they have over 73,000 people on ARVs. Uh, we learned quite a bit about their health system support, family system support, community support, and uh, one picture I took that said, the CHAZ system saved my life. People wow. believe that. It's, it's, it's uh, really amazing how they involve the full family in their care. And uh, I have a picture there. It's actually in the Mother of Mercy place, but it's with um, with a pharmacy technician. And he's the one then who distributes drugs from the warehouse. And do you have the warehouse pictures there? We went to the Chaz Drug Warehouse. And uh, here's pallet after pallet of millions of doses of drugs. And we walked into their cold room uh, because many of these drugs are very heat sensitive. And we learned that the CHAZ system takes a, a full um, full supply chain approach, uh, you know, taking after care of quantification, procurement, capacity, storage, distribution. And they make real sure that drugs leaving there have a ha uh, an expiration date beyond uh, the three months because they're generally sending out three months worth of drugs to the 73 clinics, which then pharmacy technicians uh, give to the patients. Um, we were very impressed. There are three pharmacists, four pharmacists there. We met three of them, and uh, they're doing great work. And we saw saw good examples of CHAZ uh, clinics on many of our stops. So other people are going to talk about those. Great, Fran. Thank That's you so much. Um, really appreciate that. And again, the, the warehouse was absolutely amazing. Just thinking how many hundreds of thousands of people that um, those boxes were keeping alive every year. So um, let's hear from uh, let's hear from Grace. Okay, can you hear me? We can hear you, Grace. Okay, amazing. Mm -hmm. um, well, when I returned from Zambia, my head was swimming with all the experiences we had had. And when my results group, the Northern Virginia group, went to Capitol Hill for five meetings a few days after I returned, I found that there were certain stories and observations that came to the forefront as we discussed the importance of foreign assistance with our reps and senators' aides. One of the stories I told in each meeting was about Carol, the head of our partner organization in Zambia, CTEM+. After her husband died, she discovered that she was HIV positive. Her health declined, and she eventually developed AIDS, contracted TB, and developed cancer. She was nearly comatose in the hospital, hopeless and ready to die. But she had a daughter, nine years old at the time, and Carol hung on for her sake. And it was around that time that the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria made free antiretroviral therapy, or ART, available in Zambia. So because of access to these drugs, Carol's life was saved. She's there to care for her daughter and watch her grow. She's become a community leader and advocate for health care and education in her country. And she sits on the board of the country coordinating, coordinating mechanism for the Global Fund. We marveled at Carol's story and at her fortitude and at all she's accomplished since she regained her health. And we couldn't help but reflect on the unmet potential of all the lives that are needlessly lost to AIDS, TB, and TB because of the lack of access to antiretroviral therapy. And there is one other little story I'd like to tell of the Mother of Mercy Hospice that we visited. And it was built in around 1997 to provide end of life care for all the people who were dying daily of AIDS. The remar remarkable thing about it now is that most of the beds are empty because so many fewer people are actually dying. So the hospice, which is a place of death, has been transformed into a healthcare facility and distri distribution center 
for ART drugs, so it's a place of life. And they serve over 3,000 HIV and TB patients and their families, uh, including nearly 300 children with antiretroviral therapy. And they provide maternal care and services for orphans and vulnerable children. So in our conversations on the Hill, our results group talked of how foreign assistance spending constitutes less than 1% of the US budget. And yet it's a target for spending cuts. One of the aides made the observation that those who would cut it see only a number, a cost in a column of numbers. What they're missing is the value of all the work that's being accomplished by USAID and PEPFAR and the Global Fund and all the partners who participate in this important life-saving work. It's actually a big return on a small investment. So we need to inform them and convince them of the value of that investment and continue saving lives like Carol's. Thanks for that, Grace. Really, really appreciate that. And some wonderful insights there. And again, really amazing to see a place that's, you know, was a hospice, a place where people go to die and, and really it has become a place of life. And that's true for so many places there. Um, I think David was gonna share next. Sure, I'd be glad to share. Uh wanted to follow up on uh, what Lindsay was sharing uh, earlier when we did the uh, uh, home visits. Uh, wanted to tell you a little bit about one of the uh, special home visits that we took. Uh, there was We went to see a man who lived uh, seven kilometers away from the uh, uh, child center where he was bringing his children for daycare, and he literally rode a bicycle uh, twice a day to bring his kids and pick them up. Uh, um, so we went 15, 14 kilometers round trip and we took a, uh, a van out to visit with him. We saw him at his house and uh, was very impressed by what the health workers were doing. They were uh, had a project where they were dealing with growth monitoring to make sure that the uh, children were uh, of, uh, of uh, appropriate uh, uh, height and weight for their age, she made sure that uh, they had things to play with to make sure that they kept the uh, knives in the house uh, uh, on shelves away from the children so they wouldn't hurt themselves. And it's like I, it's like they're providing the uh, parental training that uh, is often missing in less privileged countries. You know, um, you know, mothers know now how in in the United States, mothers know how to childproof their houses, but um, people in um, areas uh, less fortunate don't have that ability. And you know, and so this is protecting the children from uh, from injury. And what was even more impressive was we were driving back to the. Uh, uh, facility, and I saw a little. We saw a little child standing in the middle of the road, and the driver saw the child and, um, you know, slowed down and honked, and the child didn't move out of the road. And you know, we wondered what's going on, and the three health, the three health volunteers, immediately jumped out of the van, uh, ran out into the street, grabbed the child, and they. Uh, people came around and they said, we need to speak to the mother. And they said, they, they immediately told the mother, they said, you have to watch the child all the time. You have to make sure that he's not playing in the road. And they set up an appointment to uh, see that, to see that uh, mother. And it was moved, moved me was that, you know, uh, if, if that hadn't, if they hadn't come around, if a uh, less attentive or caring driver probably would have kept going and possibly would have hit and killed the child. So we had the opportunity to literally see a intervention that saved that child's life. And, you know, the, this, this, this child care center that we visited and, uh, you know, the healthcare volunteers, uh, one of them who happened to have a uh, Chelsea football club shirt on and, you know, I, uh, was talking to him, so we kind of bonded over uh, football, and his favorite player is Diego Costa, which 
is amazing. <laughs> Finding out someone like uh, who's famous twelve thousand miles away, and you know these volunteers are giving children the opportunity for uh, a future, and they're doing that every day. It's just wonderful to see. Thanks for that, David. Really appreciate that. Um, Liz, are you on the line, Ms. Clerkin? I am. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can, Liz. Go ahead. Great. So um, I, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, my experience when I got back and, and trying to make sense of this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Um, you know, when I got back and, and talked to people about the trip, um, they, they asked me, you know, well, what were your impressions and, and what are your memories about it? And for me, I think it was seeing for myself what I've heard from others that go um, overseas. Um, people in the developing world are really intimately aware of what's happening in the U.S. You know, they know that we lead the world in international development and people in other countries are incredibly appreciative of that. Um, for example, when we were in Lusaka, the capital, we saw these big billboards about water and sanitation projects that were brought to us, brought to the people of Zambia by the people in the United States. And even when we were in rural Zambia, when we were doing those home visits that David talked about, and we were in the facility, um, we, we got to introduce ourselves and then folks had a chance to ask us questions. And here we are in rural Zambia in a village with no electricity or running water. And their first question to us was, what's going to happen to development money from the US now that we have this new president in the US? And you know, when I would tell people that story when I came back, they were, I mean, some people were like, yeah, that's right. You know, people in the other countries know exactly what's going on in the US. Um, but other people, I think, were quite taken aback that how much we're respected and revered and how much people follow us. So that question about development money, you know, what's going to happen to development money? Well, as results volunteers, you know, we know the answer to that question. It's, you know, we need to take action. We need to call on our members of government to make international development a priority. You know, you heard Grace talk about she's already been up to the hill and talk to her members of Congress about making development a priority. And, you know, we know that every action we take, every phone call that we make to an aide, every letter that we write to an editor, every lobby visit, these, these actions take and save lives. And so I guess for me, this trip really reinforced for me how deep the connections are with people around the world and how much power we have within ourselves as results volunteers. Thanks for that, Liz. I really appreciate your insights and and uh, and you know how that stuck with you in, in terms of getting back here and all. And uh, let's see, um, let's go on to Elena now. Well, thanks everyone for being on the call tonight. And I just um, I'm gonna take a few moments to talk about one of the more rural and traditional villages we got to visit, which is a special place for many reasons. Um, First, it's where Mark got to found a school with his nonprofit and to bring education to the community. Um, but it's also a unique place in the fact that HIV is really prevalent there. And part of that's because of how it's a traditional society where the men will have multiple wives. And so one of the cultural nuances then is if two out of, let's say there are three wives and two of the wives and the man are taking medicine, that third wife will wonder, why am I not taking medicine? So we see this great um, dichotomy there. of We're getting HIV meds out there. We're getting people to be safer and take them. But then we're also seeing the spread of HIV um, still because people don't want to be different from their core families. And this is a really great opportunity to keep pushing these programs so that we can get education out there. We can keep getting meds and we can get the part of PEPFAR that does uh, prep work, which is the pre extrophylactis um, that like we use in the States as kind of, we equate it to the birth control of HIV. So that third woman who is serio negative or not showing HIV could have essentially the generic version of Truvada 
um, keep her her HIV status negative, but still feel part of the, the family and the community. So there's been a lot of great work and there's still a lot that we need. And I think that's what's most important in working with Congress still to say these programs are working and they need to continue to keep working. Thanks for that, Lena. I really appreciate that. And and so right now, what we, what we want to do is um, for the balance here tonight, we want to have uh, some question and answers from folks who want to do that. And then um, Willie Dickerson is going to um, help us think about how we might use the experience that these folks have had in Zambia and have shared with you tonight to maybe craft with for yourself a letter to the editor. And he's also going to tell us a little bit about the full training day that we did on, on training advocates in Zambia. But we want to give folks a chance to um, to ask some questions and um, to have those answered. And then if, if folks who you know did go to Zambia, if some particular insight pops pops up for you too as well, feel free to share that. So um, for folks who are on the phone, if you hit star one, you should be able to unmute your lines. For folks who are on the webinar, if you hit your if you use your mouse and, and click the little microphone icon in your window you should be able to um, unmute your line to ask a question. So any questions here? Or you can put them in the chat window as well if you've got a question or comment. Questions, comments? Okay, no worries, no worries. Um, let me check the chat window here real quick. So John Hornby says very powerful. Yeah, it, it just really pretty amazing in terms of what people did see um, and share. Thanks, John, for that. Anybody else? Don't be shy now. Great. Um, so if, if something does come up for, for you, um, Please do uh, feel free to chime in, and um, and then so then let's have let's have Willie Dickerson share a little bit about that training day that we did because again if you remember the objectives for us were a couplefold one is to see how our advocacy shows up on the ground in Zambia and again we were all very impressed with how the dollars were spent and how much the Zambians themselves were taking charge of of the programs that you know some of we were we were doing some of the funding for. But it was also to share some advocacy skills with um, our colleagues in, in Zambia as well. And Willie, are you on the line? I sure am. Okay, great, Willie. Why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about that, and then I think you were going to do a little preparation for us, maybe give us some ideas about how we might parlay some of this work into, into media. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for taking the time to join with us in this uh, experience this wonderful experience we had in Zambia. The opportunity to work with Zambian activists was nothing less than amazing. We spent three different sessions, two, one, two half day sessions and a one day session working with these volunteers. We found them eager, articulate, and quick learners. Quick learners. Uh, remember, these are the people who helped to create the first ever pledge from Zambia to the Global Fund, as was mentioned, a million a year for each of the next five years. And of course, they, like us, have to make sure the money gets put there. Um, one of the big issues that was also mentioned was building the 650 healthcare centers throughout the country so that every Zambian would be able to get to health care within a reasonable distance, especially since most of them would be walking. We heard too many stories of people dying on the way to seek help with the health care centers just too far away for a mother giving birth and having complications, ending too often in death for both mother and child or of people being killed on their walk to get their AIDS medication, which was two days away. Anyway, so we decided to base our training on that issue of 
the 650 health care centers actually being built, staffed, and uh, provisioned. And so that's what we did using that. Um, we worked with the Zambian volunteers to learn result tactics to convince their parliament to follow through with this life-saving promise. And of course, we always begin with introductions and find out about each other and our whys of doing this work. And then we moved on to a dialogue with the workshop attendees to learn about their challenges, current knowledge, and what they hope to get out of these sessions. Next on the agenda was learning about the issues and, and empowering ourselves through action. Then we went on to teach about working with the community with ourselves through action. Then on to working with the community with the EPIC format, which I'll be talking a little bit about in a minute. The action sheet, which was built around the 650 health care um, places. And then we illustrated it with a live education and action meeting. Hopefully, in this way, the participants would be able to duplicate this in the future. After lunch on the full day uh, presentation, we talked about the importance of building relationships with members of parliament via letters, town halls, or public gatherings, and in-person meetings. Included were how to conduct a meeting with a member of parliament, using stories, thanking the members for what they've done so far, presenting a clear ask, and following up. We ended with a session on writing letters to the editor, and one of our Zambian activists actually had one published shortly after in the Lusaka Times. Dialogue and questions were always welcomed and present. In the other two trainings, first we went to Kabwe, some distance away from the capital, and again, were impressed with articulate questions and the letters that these advocates wrote. When our presentation was summarized in one of the local languages, the the response was particularly animated. Two days later, back in Lusaka, the last training was presented to another audience, including members of five other NGOs, our own four Zambian Real Change Fellows, which if any of you listening are between 18 and 30, you can find out about becoming a Real Change Fellow yourself on the results.org website. The focus of this half-day session was grassroots advocacy, what it is and how to plan a campaign, including goals, targets, tactics, key messages, allies, timelines, and resources required. As with the days before, the biggest response to our training was a desire for more and gratitude. So uh, this was really an exciting experience because we aren't handing out fish to these people. We're teaching them how to fish, as the old saying goes. And that's uh, perhaps what we're doing with you on the line as well, uh, to think about writing a letter to the editor with some of the things you've heard tonight. We most often use the EPIC format, and I believe there's a slide for this. Uh, e is to engage your audience. That's the first thing that you do in your letter. Uh, P is to state the problem. I, inform about the solutions. And C, call to action. So an example of, a, of something you might write based on what you heard tonight is, um, let's see, dear editor, and then you want to engage your audience, so you might say, something like, I was recently on a call where I heard about advocates going to Zambia to both see important programs. USAID has uh, been using there to save lives and broaden hope, uh, state the problem. 
thanks to these programs, new techniques in farming are being used, and many lives are being saved uh, by bringing antiretrovirals to people with HIV AIDS. Unfortunately, there have been, this is where the problem comes in, proposed cuts to this budget. Now, of course, uh, you could even go so far as to say if the cuts are 30%, that means uh, of the 700 to 800,000 people on these antiretrovirals, 21 to 24,000 people wouldn't have that medicine anymore, and they, of course, would die, and then the, the epidemic of AIDS could spread even worse in form about solutions. With our aid budget as it is, less than twenty, less than a twentieth of one percent of the total budget, it would be easy to continue this work and perhaps even beef it up. And then the call to action: you can ask your specific representative or senators, or all three, to support the budget for USAID or you can ask other people to call them. Uh, as Ken said earlier, uh, studies show that our calls, letters, and visits to our elected representatives make all the difference. And then, of course, sign your name, et cetera. Uh, paying attention to your local newspaper's requirements, usually uh, you can almost always get away with at least 150 words up to 300 depending on your newspaper so there you have it we can each do something to make a difference thanks for that Willie really appreciate it um, so are there any other questions or thoughts that folks have um, as they've heard from from Willie Great. Um, so let's, and then feel free to put them in the chat window again. We've done a few of those in the chat window. Feel free to unmute yourselves and ask questions as well. And then, so Willie, I mean, maybe we could do just a little bit of uh, brainstorming here about um, what sort of uh, angles folks might use uh, for uh, letters to the editor. You, you did kind of talk a, a little bit about some ideas there, but um, uh, do you have do you have any ideas about that? And that's maybe something we can all do a little bit is brainstorm some ideas about how we can um, use this information, use these stories um, as a way to to generate media um, to combat these cuts. Well, of course, one good way is watching for hooks in your local newspaper. There's a lot in the paper right now about the budget, and uh, so tagging on to any of those articles about uh, cuts to the foreign assistance budget uh, would be a good way to uh, start your letter and refer to something that's already been printed. Um, another way is uh, the idea that uh, what we are doing is helping these people to become independent before USAID uh, and PEPFAR and the Global Fund were involved, uh, there was little hope uh, amongst people. One of my friends who was in the Peace Corps in Zambia said that before this happened in the 90s when he was there, it was estimated about a third of the people were HIV positive, and he said no one spoke to him about the future. And this was totally turned around based on the work we have been advocating for when we were there. We saw people trying to figure out the best way to thrive for the future and how to have education for their children and uh, what they could do to make a better country. And it was, it was just a total turnaround. So um, that as well, we're, we're not, uh, as I mentioned before, we're not just doing handouts to people. This is a hand up, a help up, and getting past the uh, pandemics, which 
USA AID told us three to five years we would have be able to see an AIDS-free generation in Zambia. They're not going to need as much help because their people are vigorous and smart and willing to do the work. So uh, that that side of things is important as well. I think that's really uh, excellent, Willie. And then, folks, if you've got ideas about uh, hooks that you – does anybody have any other ideas about hooks they might use for writing letters to the editor or things that came to them as they were thinking about um, or listening to the stories tonight? Oh, this is John Cornby. I, I, when I was listening to the story, uh, I guess I already knew this, but it really impressed me that uh, the money from the USA goes to well-established local NGOs and very well tied into the community. It's not given directly to government. I think a lot of people in the U.S. have no idea. They, they believe it goes directly to the government. It's very corrupt. The opposite is true. And, and I found that last year when I went to Kenya with some of the uh, uh, church-based uh, local organizations receiving USA. So I think that's an important point to bring out. That's really good, John. Other folks have ideas for hooks or th ways they might uh, put this into the media or in conversations with our elected officials or even your co even our neighbors and community members. I got, I got a couple of thoughts myself here and again, welcome other people thinking after this. I mean, I, you know, we've been talking a, a lot about, um, you know, with this particular administration, America first, and I and, you know, making the nation safer and all that. And um, I mean, I think the, the point is, it's like increasing our military spending while cutting our diplomacy and development programs will not make our nation safer. Um, our foreign policy is a three-legged stool that in, is, in, you know, is, is the three legs are diplomacy, defense, and development. And if you get, you make one leg really tall and then you hack off the other two, you don't have a very stable stool, and that's a good way for people to understand, um, you know, what development assistance is. And actually, putting America first is having a real good balanced approach to our foreign policy that includes all three of those things. Um, you know, the um, the the there's a letter that went to the heads of the House and the Senate um, from retired military generals, admirals, and other uh, sort of military officials. And basically they said, you really need to invest in diplomacy and development. You know, we need to invest in defense as well, but diplomacy and development are really important. And that's coming from the military folks. And in that letter to them, they quote our current defense secretary. Our current defense, defense secretary said, yeah, you can go ahead and cut the State Department and these aid programs, but then I'm just gonna have to buy more ammunition basically saying that our investments in diplomacy and development actually create more stability in other countries. They reduce desperation. They create more trusting partnerships between our nation and other nations, and they reduce the, the possibilities of terrorism and extremism taking root in the country. So that's another thought in terms of the security angle and putting America first. The economic argument is another one. You know, there's all, it's all kind of talk. How do we stimulate our economy? Well, being in partnership with countries um, that are developing economies is a really important way to create trade partners. Um, a number of years ago, it wasn't that long ago, um, it was estimated that 50% of U.S. exports were being purchased by developing nations. Not developed nations, but developing nations. So, and, and, and I guess the other one is for the, for the cost of a couple of fighter jets, basically, we can really make a huge difference in so many millions of people's lives, and that's a really humanitarian thing. Final thing is, and I think I just want to reemphasize what really, that is, you know, we are, we are actually on the, on the precipice, on the cusp, on the sort of almost apex of the hill and trying to actually end AIDS. Um, and preventable maternal and child deaths and some of the diseases of poverty. And we are on track to do some of those things. And, and if we, we make these kinds of cuts, it's really going to be a huge setback. And not that it's just going to slow things down, but it's actually going to allow a resurgence of certain diseases and, and sicknesses that 
we don't want to see. And I actually, you know, could very well even affect us in our own country. So those are just a few thoughts, um, again, about, about media. Anybody else have other thoughts or ideas? Yeah, this is David. I put a, uh, um, something that happened in, uh, at work uh, yesterday in the chat window. Uh, I was talking to a uh, young woman about my trip, and she suggested that I talk to our uh, installation newspaper about the amazing work that we're doing. So I'm following up on that. Great idea. I think talking to our editors about this stuff is really important so that they understand how these kinds of things being proposed are going to really affect our nation and actually affect so many people. That's great, David. And just talk to people about it. I mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's great. I mean, they, they love to hear the stories. And again, or if you just you joined us tonight and heard the stories, it's like you can tell folks I was on a webinar last night or last week. Then I heard just some amazing stories about how, how you know, important these investments are. Great, David. Thank you for that. Anybody else? You see, are you, are you, you have anything you want to add from your experience of being there? Sure, I'd love to. How's the audio? Can you guys hear me well? Sounds yep. great. Okay, awesome. Um, I've been, I mean, they, you guys did a great job. The advocates that I was able to, to come along with had the had the experience of being with, they did a great job of introducing what we did there and, and kind of really giving an overview of our trip. Um, just to kind of have some final thoughts, um, I, I kind of think how, how can you started this conversation about how the resources are there, right? We have all the resources to save lives, to end these epidemics that are happening. We choose to prioritize differently. So I take the pretense of um, kind of having having a, seeing the globe as, as a body itself, right? We can pump each other up by, with, uh, with protein shakes and, and pump up our biceps and make, us feel, make, us, make ourselves feel strong. But internally, we might, be, we might not be doing so well. We're not taking the proper nutrients we should in you know, a well-balanced diet. Internally, in the same way, if we were to make that reference to the globe itself, we might have a strong military. We might have all these things to show off our might. But internally, we have domestic poverty. We have global poverty. So where are we really? I mean, how far can we take um, our globe and, and the potential if so many of us are in poverty, so many of us are just striving to, to survive every day? So in that light, I see advocates as being doctors, right? They're, they're kind of showing you, hey, you have, uh, you have something wrong with your body. You have something wrong with your world. It's, it's poverty. It's people dying. You can't focus. On, on going to the moon, you can't focus on, on military spending and, and cut away things that are, are at the core of who you are, at the core of the world, um, which is everybody, which is the community in itself. Um, and, and there, I, I kind of visualize us being as doctors for the world and reprioritizing our focus and making sure that all of our, all of our needs, not just the, the wealthy, not just a few privileged that are there in some cities, in, in some countries that are developed, but everybody that's around the world. Yes, sir, I, I can't think of any better way to, to, to cap this uh, webinar off than what you just said. I, I thought that was absolutely amazing and, and, um, and touching. So I really Thank appreciate you. that. Um, well, we are at 9.58. We are um, just coming to the top of the hour. I wanna make sure we end this on time. Uh, I just want to thank um, our advocates who um, went to Zambia for sharing tonight and the preparation that you did. And I encourage you to continue to share your experience with other folks. And then for folks on the line here who were listening in, if you've got questions for um, some of our advocates, you know, you can it, reach out to them directly. You can also contact Mark or I and to put us in contact, uh, have you uh, put us in contact uh, with, with them, with you. Um, and then we do have a lot of photos and all, and we're, we're still kind of working on um, putting together some, uh, a place where people can see some of those things as well. But thanks everybody tonight. And, um, let's go out and advocate. Let's write, let's, let's be the, the doctors, um, that, that, that Yasir talked about. So have, everybody have a great night.